I guess let's get started. Where are my slides? So believe it or not, we finished microprogram microarchitectures in one class, <laughs> last lecture. Everybody knows everything about them now? Mm -hmm. Good. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. We're going to talk about another concept that's beautiful, uh, pipelining today. And hopefully we'll finish it today, including data dependent sampling. <coughs> you guys know about pipelining probably, right? How many of you know how it works? You don't cover it in 213? I mean, how much that chapter? <laughs> There's a chapter. chapter four, let's get you don't, I know you don't design a pipeline process, that's what you'll do here. Oh, no. yeah. But do you know about data dependencies, control dependencies? No? Some of you do. Who knows about data dependencies, control dependencies? So, who doesn't? Feel free to. Okay, so most of you don't know that. Okay, so this should be fun then. <laughs> well, even if you know it, it should be fun. It's fun for me <laughs> after so many years. Okay. So this is what I left you with, actually. Can we do better than micro, better than a multi-cycle microprogram design? What limitations do you see with a multi-cycle design? And I think I've flashed the answer. What is the limit? Yes? You're only using most of the processor for a s one cycle out of many? Mm -hmm. Basically, in a given cycle, you're using a very little portion of the processor. That way. For example, if you're loading from memory, pretty much the entire data path is left idle. Right? So you're not doing anything at all in that data path. So you're wasting a lot of concurrency that, is, that you can potentially exploit. Uh, I already said this basically. <coughs> For example, fetch logic is idle when instructions being decoded or executed. Right? Most of the data path is idle when a memory access is happening. I guess I could switch to the picture, but I'll show you the picture. That might be better. Uh, if you remember uh, the state machine uh, and the data path figure for LC3B, in certain states, you're not using, oh, there's the data path. In certain states, you're not using most of the data path. For example, I don't know if you guys see, can see this, but <laughs> Uh, there's a state over here where we're waiting for memory. Remember state 33? <laughs> can you guys see it? But you can remember it, right? We were waiting for memory to return data. <coughs> and conditionally, you go to state 35 or state state 33. During that state, if you look at this, this is the data path, only this part of the entire system is being used. This entire data path is idle. You're not doing anything, basically. You're wasting all of these resources. So that's the downside of this. You build this hardware, you could potentially do more things concurrently, but you're not doing that. So the key question is, can we use the idle hardware to improve concurrency? And the answer is yes. And I'll show you with pipelining. Uh, pipelining is a method to do that. So the goal is to get more concurrency, which is equivalent to throughput, basically more work completed in one cycle. And the idea is when an instruction is being executed or using some resources in its processing phase, process other instructions on the idle resources, potentially in different phases. Right. Uh, and of course, on the idle resources that are not needed by that instruction. For example, when an instruction is being decoded, fetch the next instruction, concurrently, at the same time. When an instruction is being executed, decode the next instruction. When an instruction is accessing uh, accessing the data memory, execute the next instruction. And when an instruction is writing its result into the register file, access data memory for the next instruction. So you can see that there's a pipeline now, right? Every processing phase is happening in the processor except for different instructions. And the hope is that these are happening in different resources such that they do not conflict with each other at all. Now you're processing one, two, three, four instructions in parallel. One is being fetched, one is being decoded, one is being executed, one is accessing memory, and one is writing its results into the register file, which means that you're actually executing five instructions, right? Based on this. Pretty powerful, right? As long as you have the resources that are separate to do that, it's great. And most of the resources are actually separate in this data path. Maybe fetch and memory access is not separate, right? They both need the memory. This is called a resource contention, so you may not be able to do this. And the bus. 
and sure. the bus, exactly. So we'll, we'll actually try to increase the resources. So if you really want to do this perfectly, you need to increase the resources because one single bus may not work in this case. And we will see that pipelining actually increases area cost a little bit. And the goal is to improve concurrency. Okay, so the basic idea is very simple, basically. So more systematically, pipeline the execution of multiple instructions. It's like assembly line processing of instructions. You know assembly line processing in a factory? When uh, a part of uh, the car is assembled, some other part is being built toward the end of the factory, right? And these parts basically move through the pipeline such that eventually they form the car. That's one example. I'll give you a laundry analogy, which is also interesting. So the idea is divide the instruction processing cycle into distinct stages of processing. They don't necessarily have to be the six stages that we discussed. It could be 25 stages. And ensure that there are enough hardware resources to process one instruction in each stage. And process different instruction in each stage. Make sense? Uh, is, uh, basically, if you are following the von Neumann model, which we have been following and we will, we will follow for a while, instruction consecutive in a program order are processed in consecutive cycles in the same stage, right. hopefully, barring some dependencies that we will discuss soon. So the benefit is hopefully obvious, right? You've increased concurrency now. You've increased instruction processing throughput. So you're doing multiple instructions per cycle now, right? You're still finishing one instruction per cycle at the end of the pipeline, as we will see in the figures. But at any given point in time, you're doing multiple instructions per cycle. So hopefully, your throop within the pipeline is one instruction per cycle at the end. But the latency of an instruction may be multiple cycles. Right. So let me give you, well, I guess there's a downside to this also. And I'm giving you a part of the downside, right? We've discussed this. Resources may not be enough. So you may want to scrap the single bus design and have multiple buses to support whatever I described over here. And we will do that. That's one downside. But think about other potential downsides. Will this lengthen the time to process an instruction, for example? It may. And it will. Yes? So when they talk about like cycle per instruction and instruction per cycle, so instruction per cycle, is that like how many things are pipelining at once? Or is that like just the inverse of CPI? Yeah. So they're two different things, right? They're actually uh, inverse of each other. Okay. So when we talk about cycles per instruction, uh, let me, uh, if, if you have a pipeline processor, I show pipelining this way. You actually always look at how many instructions you're finishing, completing per cycle. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's really instructions completed per cycle. That's not the same, the same thing as how many instructions you're processing in a given cycle. Yeah. Does that make sense? <coughs> and we will, we, will, we will get back to this, especially when we talk about speculative execution. For example, you may be actually processing many, many more instructions than you need because you may want to achieve some speculative execution. We might have to do prefetching. But they don't contribute to instructions processed because they're not real instructions, right? Okay. It's really the complete instructions. We'll get back to that. That's a good question. Okay, start thinking about the downsides. We're going to try to get rid of the downsides later on. So, okay, this is, well, <laughs> this fits well. Basically, if you think about the execution of four independent add instructions, this is how I divided the pipeline, if you will. If you have a multi-cycle machine, assume that add goes through four uh, cycles, fetch, decode, execute, and write back, write result. This is how four adds will execute, right? You don't fetch the second add until the first add completes. So every ad takes exactly four cycles in this case. So it takes 16 cycles, or four cycles per instruction. That's the CPI. If you look at the pipeline machine, this is what you would get, right? When you're fetching uh, the, the uh, well, I guess let's look at this one. This is the first ad. When you're writing its result, you're actually decoding the second ad, right? And you're, uh, well, it's, it's actually this way. Well, you fetch the first instruction, and while you're decoding it, you're fetching the next instruction. Right? While you're executing the first instruction, you're decoding the second instruction, fetching the next instruction. While you're writing back the results of the first instruction, you're executing the second instruction, you're decoding the third instruction, you're fetching the fourth instruction. So at the steady state, if you will, steady state means pipeline is full. Here, the pipeline is not a steady state, right? Because if you look at this, this is time, time cycle one, uh, cycle, one cycle two, cycle two, three, cycle four, 
pipeline is full that all of the stages have an instruction in it. Here, if you look at it vertically, not all stages have an instruction because we have four stages, fetch, decode, execute, write that. At the steady state, if you will, you would be retiring or com completing four, uh, well, uh, you, you would be completing four instructions every four cycles, okay? which means you'll be completing one instruction per cycle as you see over here. Make sense? So that's the throughput improvements. Now we have one instruction per cycle instead of four 0 0.25 instructions per cycle. You can think of it the other way around too. Okay, I'll ask this question. Is life always this beautiful? So what's, what's the assumption here? Yes? That you always know what instruction to run next. That's right, that's one good assumption. What else? Yes? The data is always ready when you need it. That's right, basically these are four independent ads, right? Hopefully. They, they, don't need, they don't need the data from each other in this case. What else? Yeah. yeah? Can you like physically like or like do you always feed those like hardware units to the chip? Like um, maybe like the limitations. Yeah, you may have some resource contention. Maybe in this four ads you don't have that, but you may have resource contention as we will see later. Yes. As always that memory is not always one clock cycle, and it would be a bad design if you made your entire possible memory <coughs> latency your critical path. Exactly, yes, exactly. Memory is another issue. How do you handle memory stalls here? And we'll get back to that. These are all good issues. So life is not always this beautiful. So we'll, we'll try to cover all of these non-beautiful cases and still get, still try to get one cycle per instruction, or one instruction per cycle, and even more later on during the course. Okay. So there's this laundry analogy that uh, one of the books has, the Patterson and Hennessy. Laundry analogy is a nice analogy, I guess, uh, for this. Basically, uh, one load of laundry goes through four different steps, instruction processing cycle, right? You place one dirty load of cloth, clothes in the washer. When the washer is finished, place the wet load in the dryer. When the dryer is finished, take off the dry load and fold. And when that's finished, uh, ask your roommate to put the clothes away. <laughs> or do it yourself, right? You could actually ask someone else to do all of these, but... <laughs> I'm sure all of you have done enough laundry, right? It's every, uh, every step is dependent on the previous step. Right? But if you have multiple loads, they're independent. This is a multi-cycle laundry design, if you will. Uh, and different steps do not share the resources. You cannot dry clothes in a washer. You cannot, uh, I guess, you, you don't need the dryer to fold the clothes, right? Nobody folds dry, uh, clothes in their dryer. Make sense? So it has these three properties. Step to do a load are sequentially dependent. Different loads are independent. And different steps do not share resources. So it's kind of similar to instruction processing. Not exactly, but think about it now. So this is a multi-cycle design for laundry. It makes no sense, right? You'd be waiting. If you start at 6 p.m., you would be waiting until 2 a.m. to do four loads of laundry. If you have these resources, at least four, one resources for each. Assuming that uh, each resource takes uh, 30 minutes to complete. Washer takes 30 minutes, dryer takes 30 minutes. So pipelining basically reduces that time and improves throughput, right? This is what you get to do four loads of laundry. You can do them in parallel. Basically, once the first load is in the dryer, the second load can go into the washer. Once the first load is being folded, the second load can go into the uh, dryer, and the third load can go into the washer. And at the steady state, there is one load at each stage of the laundry processing pipeline. And you, you don't need any additional resources in this case, because it's beautiful. Everything is independent of each other. Each load is independent. And throughput is increased by 4 in this case. right? And you're done by 9.30 p.m. And then you can play games or do your 447 assignment. <laughs> Actually, you should be doing your 447 assignment while all of this is going on. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> and latency per load is the same, though. If you look at this, the latency is for uh, four, uh, time units right? for each load. So that's critical. In a pipeline, you haven't changed the latency. Actually, we will see that you'll increase the latency, really in a real pipe, uh, processing pipe, into instruction processing pipeline, but you improve the throughput. Make sense? 
by improving the throughput, you, you reduce the latency of the entire program or entire set of loads to finish, but not individual load latency. That doesn't uh, reduce. Now, there's another issue. Uh, you may have faced this. These dryers never finish in 30 minutes. <coughs> if they finish in 30 minutes, you would be wearing wet clothes. So it just, that just doesn't work. So they actually look like this. They take longer <laughs> than everything else, right? Is that, is that everyone's experience? Yeah. We need better dryers, perhaps. <laughs> but if you increase the heat, then there's damage that happens to the clothes. So that's a trade-off, too. <laughs> so let's assume the dryer takes two uh, time units, or one hour instead of 30 minutes. This is what you get in a multi-cycle design. Well, you'd be up on, uh, well beyond 3 a.m. <laughs> and this is what you get in a pipeline design. Now your throughput is not four, uh, four loads, right? Four loads of uh, laundry in parallel. Your throughput has reduced, right? The slowest stage actually decides your throughput because you cannot start the next load. Uh, you cannot put the next load in the dryer until this previous load is done in the dryer. And this previous load is taking very long. Does that make sense? So this is bad. This means that you really want to balance the pipeline stages. This is one way of doing that. One way, one way is actually compartmentalizing the dryer, but that doesn't work, right? Because it's really a latency problem. So how do you fix this problem? Buy a second dryer. Exactly. You can buy a second dryer and put the, <laughs> put the second load, put the alternating loads in different dryers such that their latencies can now overlap. So pipelining is really about overlapping latencies, improving concurrency. You have the lo long latency of a single instruction, you're overlapping it with different instructions. Now you're back to the same throughput, except you increase your cost. It's a very nice analogy because that's exactly how things work in a real instruction processing pipeline too. If your multiplier is taking very long, and if you cannot pipeline it somehow, in this case you cannot pipeline it, then better to have a second multiplier if you want to keep the throughput. And multiplies are a lot, uh, a good fraction of your problem. Okay, so an ideal pipeline. This is actually close to an ideal pipeline, if you will. Uh, what do I mean by an ideal pipeline? Uh, in a, well, in any pipeline, our goal is to increase throughput with little increasing cost. Cost is hardware cost in case of instruction <coughs> processing. An ideal pipeline has three properties. You repeat identical operations on the pipeline. Basically, the same operations are repeated on a large number of different inputs. This is the computer science terminology, if you will. What do I mean by this? In a laundry pipeline, you have identical loads. Or loads do the same thing, right? They go through the same stage. Now think about instruction processing. This is not exactly true, right? You don't always do the same instruction. Operation, in this case, means instruction. You don't always execute the same instruction on the pipeline. They're very different. So that's going to cause some challenges. And operations are independent of each other. There's no dependency between repeated operations. In this case, the second load has no dependency on the first load, right? You can reorder them perfectly. That's not true of instructions also, right? At least most instructions, many instructions. I shouldn't say most because surprisingly there's a lot of independence which we're going to exploit later on. And finally, an ideal pipeline, you can Partition the sub-operations, or stages, if you will, uniformly, or perfectly, such that they're exactly equal. You're not wasting any time in each stage. Processing can be evenly divided into uniform latency sub-operations that do not share resources. In this case, I've assumed that that's the case. This takes exactly 30 minutes. Well, this is the cooked up. Well, not necessarily cooked up. That's the real case, but let's go back to here. This is ex takes exactly 30 minutes, exactly 30 minutes, exactly 30 minutes, exactly 30 minutes. If that's the case, it's an ideal pipeline. But we'll see that it's not well, easy to do that. Automob automobile assembly line could be close to ideal. Doing laundry could be close to ideal. Not necessarily, though. Think about it. How about the instruction processing cycle? I already told you, right? It's, it's actually tough to make it ideal. But we're, we're going to overcome those non-ideal parts. So let me show you ideal pipelining <laughs> from uh, an instruction processing standpoint. This is what we would like to do. So for an instruction, uh, we have, let's assume that we're go going to process, it, it takes 
typical seconds to do everything related to the instruction. Fetch, decode, execute, memory access, write back. And after that, you latch the results and you go on to the next instruction. The throughput of this is, or magnitude of this is, proportional to 1 over t, right, picoseconds. You're completing one instruction every t picoseconds. Let's assume that we want to pipeline this uh, with two stages and improve throughput twice. If you would like to do that, this is what we can try to do. We have two stages. One takes t over 2 picoseconds. Let's do, let's say, fetch, decode, execute. Lash the result. In the next stage, you can do memory access right back. T over 2 picoseconds, you would hope. If you could do that, you, could, you will double the throughput. It turns out it's tough to do. And if you want to improve uh, this, improve the throughput 3x compared to the baseline, this is what you would do. Divide each stage equally, <coughs> such that it takes t over 3 picoseconds, and you lash the result after every stage. Make sense? This improves your throughput 3 over t. This is kind of ideal. Well, there is overhead, as you can see here, right? Obviously, this, is not, this doesn't come free, this latch. It takes time to latch things. And it takes cost to latch things. So let's examine it with, the, with that time. So if you have a non-pipeline version with delay t for an entire instruction processing, let's say, uh, your real bandwidth, your real throughput is really 1 divided by t plus s, where s is the latch delay. It's a simplified form. And if you want to divide it by into k stages, you can divide, assuming, assuming you can divide this equally, your processing is really, uh, each stage takes t over k picoseconds, assuming you can divide equally, that's an assumption too. But you also have this latching overhead, s picoseconds to latch at the end of each stage. Does that make sense? So your real throughput of a k-stage pipeline is 1 divided by t over k plus s. And assuming that you have your maximum throughput could be, assuming k goes to infinity, infinite number of stages, your maximum throughput is limited by the latching overhead. So you can never get infinite throughput. This again, Amdahl's law, right? If the latching overhead is really high compared to your pipeline stage, then at some point you don't want to keep pipeline because you're limited by that overhead. Make sense? Remember the Amdahl's law that I discussed earlier? This is another place where Amdahl's law dictates your maximum throughput, maximum performance. Okay, let's analyze the cost. Again, in a more realistic pipeline, cost, uh, you, you, whenever you add a pipeline stage, you actually add latching cost. And we'll see that you can add other costs also if you want to keep the throughput. Uh, you may have G gates to implement everything. Uh, in uh, to process every instruction, and uh, the cost of a nine pipeline version is G, G plus L, where L is the latch cost. Once you pipeline it, even if, even if you can divide gates ideally this way, G divided by K for a K stage pipeline, the entire cost is you keep the same combinational number of gates, but now your latching overhead increases. For each stage, you need to add one latch at the end, so it's L K. That's another reason why you don't want to pipeline more and more. OK. This is theoretical right now. Let's go into the details of it, the pipeline, the instruction processing. Any questions so far? OK. So how do we actually pipeline the processing of this instruction processing cycle? You, you, you already know this by now, so I'm not going to go over it. Fetch, decode, evaluate address, fetch operands, execute, store result. You don't need to have stages that correspond exactly to this. One key question is how do you actually break down the stages? And this could be one way. You really would like to remember balance the stages such that no stage wastes any time. I'm going to show you a pipeline that uses, uh, uh, that has five stages, instruction fetch, instruction decode slash register file read, execute or address generate, memory access, store or write back result. This is a single cycle microarchitecture that you, you've seen and come to love. Right. You like it so far. And you're building it now. Uh, this is the throughput that we have. Assuming that you have t cycles, uh, t, t picoseconds for everything. Now, this is how we divided the pipeline, basically. Instruction fetch, 
takes 200 picoseconds. Instruction decode register file read takes 100 picoseconds. Execute takes 200 picoseconds, 200 picoseconds, 100 picoseconds. This is based on the results picoseconds that I showed you earlier, right? Remember? Well, this is, is this a balanced pipeline? Not really, right? Not all stages. A balanced pipeline is a pipeline where all stages take the same amount of time. It's not balanced. Now, what, one issue you'll face is that it's hard to balance a pipeline because you need to really ensure that every combinational delay, every critical path within each stage is exactly the same. That may be difficult because this memory may inherently take longer than this register file, right? Now, you may want to add some more logic over here, but you may not be able to break everything nicely, right? Your design complexity <laughs> may go high, may increase. So there are a lot of trade-offs associated with how many stages actually do you put? Why not have four stages or six stages? Why not have different boundaries? And the goal here is, again, maximize throughput and minimize the critical path. But let's assume this design for now. Part, part, partly this is art, actually, also. Because there are many things that you need to implement. And you, uh, this is an iterative process. You may come up with a pipeline design, and you find out that your critical path in one stage is very long. What do you do in that case? Well, maybe you break that stage into two stages, right? That's one option. Or maybe you merge some other stages such that things are balanced. So the pipeline design is an iterative process, too. Okay. Uh, well, you need to do register file writes. So somehow, uh, we will, I'll, I'll foreshadow some of the issues. When you're actually writing back a result, you're actually also reading from the register file. So you'd better ensure that there is no resource conflict, right? Maybe this instruction over here is reading the register that's being written by this instruction. How do you ensure that this gets the correct value? How do you ensure any instruction gets the correct value, right? <laughs> Maybe when this load is being executing, this instruction needs that value. OK? And ignore for now this one. This, is, this will cause us problems. This is a control dependence, right? Uh, this is, if, there, if you have a taken branch, uh, the address needs to be fed into the PC. But when you're fetching the branch, uh, you fetch the branch, you don't know if it's a branch, right? You haven't decoded it yet. It goes to the next stage. When you're decoding it, if you want to keep the pipeline full, you'd better know what instruction to fetch next, right? If it's a taken branch, the next program counter, PC plus four in this case, is not the right place to fetch from. And the branch target is determined over here, which means that until the branch is executed, you do not know which are the next three instructions. So how do you keep the pipeline full in the presence of branches? That's a fascinating topic. How do you handle that control dependence? What do you fetch next? So keep that in mind. OK, so let's take a look at the throughput of this pipeline. Uh, this is what you have uh, with the values that I showed you over here with a, a single cycle uh, machine. It takes 800 picoseconds to execute every instruction. Uh, well, it could be a multi-cycle multi machine also, because we're, we're ignoring the latch overhead over here. I don't show you any latch overhead. Uh, but, but in a pipeline machine, your instruction, uh, your, your cycle time is uh, dominated, uh, dictated by this 200 picoseconds. The cycle time will be 200 picoseconds. And this is how the instructions will execute. Assume that all of them are independent, and these are the independent loads. This is what will happen, basically. Every cycle takes 200 picoseconds. And to be able to execute these loads, you take, it doesn't look right, like one, two, three, four, five. Yes, there you go. Because this register really ends. <laughs> yeah, you don't do any processing over here because register file write takes uh, 100 picoseconds. So it takes 1,000 picoseconds to execute a single instruction. Right? So basically, you increase the latency, right? What we've done is before, if we didn't pipeline, We've also uh, eliminating the latch overhead. An instruction took 800 picoseconds. Right. Now, because we pipeline, the instruction latency is 1,000 picoseconds. Because the, each stage needs to have, take the same amount of time. And we haven't balanced the stage as well. That's why the five stage, even though you have five stages, the speed up you get is really four, not five. Does that make sense? 
You can, make, you can do that calculation yourself because you increase the latency of each instruction now. So you could, that's the downside of not balancing the pipeline. You may increase the raw latency of the instruction. You, yes, you're improving throughputs, but you're not improving throughputs as much as you really could ideally. <coughs> so whenever you're designing a pipeline, try not to increase the raw latency of an instruction. And balancing the pipeline is one thing you could do. The second thing is minimizing the latching overhead. Now that's a tough thing to get rid of. OK. So the second thing, well, we've discussed this. Basically, if you want to pipeline this, you'd better add some registers to latch the intermediate results, right? Otherwise, it's impossible to do something else in the data path uh, while you're doing something uh, in another part. So that's why you have these pipeline registers, if you will, or latches. <coughs> in between the stages. That enables you to process, do processing in this stage independently of the processing in this stage because this stage is using results that are latched here and this stage is using results that are latched here and this stage is using results that are latched here and this stage is using results that are latched here. Make sense? And I, uh, these are termed instruction fetch slash instruction decode pipeline registers, instruction decode slash execute dot dot dot. Right? That's the terminology. So let's take a look at what needs to go into these registers. Basically, whatever is needed to do the processing in this stage has to be in the slash, right? And more, because you may need processing here. You better have, you better propagate things that you need from the previous stages. I'll show you an example. For example, uh, this is the fetch PC, fetch program counter. After you fetch, you get the instruction register. And you get the PC plus four. But you don't need PC plus four in this stage. Why do you need PC plus four? Because branch calculates its target in this stage and it's execute. PC plus four is added to some sign extended left shifted immediate. Now you form the next PC. And if the branch is taken, this next PC should be lashed into the PC. So you need this PC plus four until here, which means that you should propagate that value across the pipeline registers. Similarly, other results also. For example, this is, uh, you, you read the data out from the register file for, uh, for instructions that need it. You get the immediate, and you do the computation here. You flash the ALU result at the end, right? Uh, and actually, you may need this second register here. And that gets propagated down. Even though there's no processing for that register over here, it's needed to store the data to memory if the instructions are stored. Basically, propagate any value that we need later on in the, la in the pipeline latches. That's one thing that the uh, latches need to contain. Okay, is this clear? Makes sense, right? And obviously, no resource is used by more than one stage. Otherwise, you would get conflict. Okay, let's, let's take a look at a quick example. But I want to make sure that everybody understands the concept. Yes? OK. So let's take a look at loads. This is, uh, we're, we're fetching a load instruction. At this point, you only know the PC of the load, right? And while that load instruction is being fetched, nothing is happening. Now the pipeline is empty, if you will. While this load instruction is, well, I guess let's, load instruction does this. Let's, let's look at the flow of that single load instruction first. Basically, it reads the registers. It generates, uh, these are the resources it uses, basically. It reads the registers. It generates its address using the ALU. This resource is really not needed. Uh, but it has to be there for other instructions. It loads the data from memory, and then it writes back its result. Now, if we, uh, if we pipeline the, uh, two loads, I'll show you an example later on. Basically, they will be going through the pipeline together. But one thing. All instruction classes actually must follow the same path and timing through the pipeline stages. Which means that, for example, there may be some instruction that does not need data memory access, right? But you design your pipeline this way such that every instruction goes through this data memory access stage. In this stage, for example, nothing else other than data memory access happens. Like this branch is communicated. Let's ignore that for now. But every instruction, even though they do not need this Data memory access needs to go through that stage. Right? Except nothing happens for that instruction at that stage. Right? You just propagate everything to the next stage. So that does have performance impact, obviously. 
an add instruction now takes five cycles, uh, five uh, stages, whereas it could have taken four stages. Make sense? And that leads you to lose throughput also. So let's take a look at two loads. Uh, well, I guess the load and subtract. Uh, once, the sec once the load is being fetched, nothing else happens. Now we're filling the pipeline, if you will. Once the second load, uh, the load is being decoded, the second instruction is being fetched. Once this load is calculating its address, the second instruction is being decoded. Once this load is accessing memory, the second instruction is being ac executed. <coughs> nice, right? Once this load is writing back, uh, the, the, second uh, the second subtract is accessing memory, but it's not accessing memory because it doesn't need to access memory. So it's just propagating its results. And later on, the load is gone, and subtract writes its result back. So it takes six clock cycles to execute. I'll, I'll ask you again, is life always this beautiful? It's not, right? This, in this case, I show you an example where the subtract was independent of the load. Load is writing to register 10 in MIPS terminology. Subtract is reading from register 2 and register 3. So they're completely independent of each other. But if the subtract was dependent on the load, it couldn't go and execute. You couldn't do this. Because assume that subtract is sourcing register 10, load is writing to register 10, load value is not available at this point while subtract is doing its execution. This is called the data dependence. And you'll have to find a way of stopping the subtract from going forward. You'll have to find a way of detecting this first. You'll need to detect whether the uh, later instruction is dependent on a previous instruction who has not produced its result yet. And second, you need to have a built in, build into the hardware ways of stopping this subtract from going forward until the result is ready. And that's called data dependence handling. And we'll talk about that a lot. Okay, I'll go through this relatively quickly. I think you guys got the idea of pipelining, right? Basically, if you look at it from an operation view, this is what it looks like in a pipeline. This is time on the x-axis, instructions on the y-axis, and each instruction going through each pipeline stage. This is the part where the pipeline is being filled, if you will, and this is where pipeline is full. So you have five instructions being processed concurrently, but you're always finishing one instruction per cycle in the steady state. Okay? And you can also look at the resource view. At any given time, uh, you're basically utilizing uh, all of the stages right? when the pipeline is full. Okay, pretty picture, but that's okay. Okay, control points in a pipeline. If you actually design the single cycle processor, single cycle data path, the control points are the same. They don't really change, at least for the data path elements. There are some other control points that we will discuss related to stalls that need to be added. But these control points are the same. Register write signal, ALU source signal, what should the ALU do, uh, branch condition calculation, logic control signal, the PC source, MUX signals, they're all the same except they're utilized at different stages. Right. Basically, how do you generate the control for uh, a pipeline? For a given instruction, you have the same control signals, but control signals are now required at different cycles, right. Depend, uh, depending on the stage. There are several options uh, for doing this. You could, for example, decode all of the control signals when you decode the instruction, right? generate all the control signals, uh, with the same logic as single cycle data path and buffer those control signals until they're consumed. I'll show you an example of this. This is the example, basically. You could have the control logic generating all possible control signals that could be generated just based on this instruction and classify the control signals that are going to be used later on. These are the control signals that are going to be used in the execute stage. These are the control signals that are going to be used in the memory stage and these are the control signals that are going to be used in the write back stage and propagate them down as they're needed. Once the control signals of the execute stage over here are consumed, they don't need to be propagated down. So the pipeline latches can look like this if you do this. Does that make sense? You basically generate all control signals you're going to need later on. That's why now you have imbalance in the pipeline latches. Another alternative is you can carry relevant instruction words or fields such that you generate the control signals right before they're needed, right? In the stage, uh, so if you need the control signals, uh, the, the control signal, this is the memory stage, you need some control signals over here, you can generate them in this cycle, such that they're available right before. 
instead of generating everything here and carrying it forward. That's another approach. This now equalizes the latches a little bit better. <coughs> well, which one is better? It depends. There you go. You got the answer right. <laughs> it depends, right, what you're optimizing for. Yes. Also, like for the arm, you probably wouldn't want to do the latter one because the instructions aren't as pretty as like alpha, where it's the mm -hmm. same field to indicate an opcode or something like that. Exactly. Yes. You you may not want to do that for if the if the fields are clear, you can do this more easily. Yeah. Whereas if you because if you do this, you may be replicating some control logic also. You have some control logic here, and you may be decoding it again right, to generate the control signals. So that's the overhead. You have some combinational overhead that is traded off with some sequential latching overheads. OK. So this is one design where pipeline control signals are generated early on. And this is the design in your book, for example. Anyway, I'm not going to go over this. But this shows the uh, uh, signals that are, for example, the register write signal is needed in this last stage, even though the resource is present here. Uh, and that signal just gets propagated down the pipeline, and it's not used over here. OK? Although we will see that it's used for some other purpose later on when we talk about data forwarding. OK. So these were the ideal pipeline, right? Uh, examples. So let's take a look at how uh, instruction processing actually pairs uh, in terms of these ideal pipeline properties. And none of these are true for the instruction processing pipeline, right? <laughs> you don't process identical operations in the pipeline. Different instructions do not need all stages. And where, where, however, when you design the pipeline, you need to force every instruction go, to go to every stage, right? That's the idea of a pipeline. And this leads to external fragmentation from the pipeline stage point of view. Basically, some pipe stages are so idle for some instructions, right? An add doesn't use the memory stage, for example. And that increases latency. Some operations are not uniform. It's difficult to balance the different pipeline stages, and I uh, said that earlier. And this leads to internal fragmentation, which means that some, uh, from the point of view of a pipeline stage, some pipe stages are too fast. They're done quickly, but it needs to take the same amount of time because everything operates based on a clock, right? the same clock cycle. And this increases latency also. <coughs> and finally, independent operations exist, but there are many operations that are dependent on each other. Instructions are not always independent of each other, right? which means that we need to somehow detect and resolve these dependencies to ensure pipeline operates correctly. You cannot ignore these. Right? And this uh, also adds latency. All of these increase latency in the pipeline. And pipe this also means that pipeline is not always moving. Right? If you're waiting for a result, then you need to stall the pipeline. Stalling the pipeline means stopping some stages in the pipeline until the values that are needed for those stages to proceed are ready. Okay? So we'll take a look at stalling a lot. And this brings me to the issues in pipeline design. Well, we still have time. Is this interesting? Yeah. Do I ask you hard questions to wake some of you up? <laughs> OK. But th these are actually fundamental issues in pipeline design, basically what I have described. The first is balancing work in pipeline stages. How many stages do you have, and what is done in each stage? I'm not going to talk about this further. This is more of a design uh, problem. But you'll, you'll do this, actually, uh, partially in your pipelining assignment, and hopefully in the extra credit even more. The second is, and this is critical, we're going to focus a lot on this, uh, keeping the pipeline correct, moving, and full, these three properties, in the presence of events that disrupt the pipeline flow. And we've already discussed a couple of, a few events. And there are three key things. One is dependencies, resource contention, and long latency operations. You could argue that long latency operations are very similar to dependencies, and that's true. But long latency operations pose difficulties in pipeline because you cannot balance things really well. So we're going to handle this uh, later on separately. Basically, correct, moving, and full. That's what you need, right? Correct means you should get the correct result. Moving means you shouldn't deadlock. And full is good for performance, right? Assuming these two are satisfied. You can keep the pipeline full, but you're deadlocked. Well, that way, <laughs> nothing progresses, right? OK, 
So we'll talk about dependency handling and resource contention. And finally, the other fundamental issue is handling exception and interrupts. This is true for any machine, and I've asked you this question in the microprogram machine too. How do you actually handle exceptions and interrupts here? If we've changed the von Neumann model a little bit, right? We're processing multiple instructions per cycle internally. So we'd better have a clean state to handle exceptions and interrupts. And more advanced, how do we improve pipeline throughput? How do we minimize the stalls? We're going to talk about this actually uh, right now too. Okay, what are the causes of pipeline stalls? A stall is basically a stage or multiple stages in the pipeline is not moving or should not move because there's something that caused it. Resource contention is one of them, and we'll see that. Dependencies between instructions, data dependencies and control dependencies, and long latency operations. Let's look at dependencies first. I'll call it, well, it's all called dependency, or dependence. Actually, I like dependence better, but I usually say dependency. Uh, sometimes hazard is used. Hazard is very hazardous, I think. <laughs> it feels kind of scary. I think it's a hazard only when it's not handled well, right? Uh, but basically, uh, well, I'll, I'll stick to the term dependence or dependency. These dictate ordering requirements between instructions, right? And there are two types, data dependence and control dependence. Resource contention is sometimes called resource dependence. You really depend on a resource. But I'll treat it differently. It's not fundamental to program behavior, right? It's not fundamental to program semantics. If you have infinite resources, there is no resource contention. So we'll treat it separately. But let me first treat that, actually. Uh, how do you handle resource contention? This happens when instructions in different pipeline stages need the same resource. Okay. Can you think of examples? Yes? When you want to increment the PC, but you want to use the ALU to do the increment. That's right. So that could be one thing. Exactly. Well, in that case, fetch stage needs the ALU, as well as execute stage needs the ALU, which means that you cannot fetch an instruction when there is an instruction that needs the ALU in the execute stage. So to handle that, you need to really replicate the at least the incrementer in the base stage. Yes? I mean, this depends on your register file, but if you're reading the operands and you're potentially writing back the result. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right, exactly. That depends on your register file, too. That could be a, uh, if you have one read, work, read, read write port to your register file, you can do only one. That's good. Well, solution one is eliminate the cause of contention, right? Basically, you have another adder in the fetch stage. That way, you break the resource dependence. You duplicate the resource or increase its throughput. Uh, in, in your case, for example, register file, you add one more port to the register file. One read port, one write port, and now you can do both in the same cycle. Well, another uh, resource is memory, right? When you're fetching from memory, uh, in, in the instruction fetch stage, every instruction needs to fetch from memory. But there's also a memory stage where load and store instructions need to fetch from memory. Let's say load needs to fetch from memory. If you have one read port to memory, again, that's a resource contention. One way of handling it would be using separate instruction and data memories, caches, as we will see. Uh, the second way of handling is using multiple ports for these memory structures. And the second solution, if, you, if this is not feasible or if it's too expensive, you could do this. You could detect the resource contention and stall one of the contending stages. Then the question is, which stage do you stall? What if you have a single read and write port for the register file, just like you described? You have a, a, you have a five stage pipeline, and this is the fetch, decode, register file read, uh, execute address generate, memory, and write back. You have one instruction here that's writing its result to R2, and you write one instruction here that's reading its result from R3, let's say. There is no dependencies. And you have only one port to your register file. Which state do you stall in this case? Yes. Well, the earlier one, because if you stall the later one, then the earlier one can't progress. Exactly, yes. Exactly. You stall, uh, you basically let this go, such that the pipeline moves, right? Remember, our goal is to keep the pipeline moving. So you stall this one such that this can write, and now this can read in the next cycle and go. OK, I guess that was it. Uh, you, could, you could basically do the same thing for memory also. I hope they're not waiting for this class. OK, so that's resource contention. 
Make sense? You can handle it <coughs> simply, hopefully, with some solution. And again, how you handle it depends on the cost of the solution as well as the performance impact. For example, it's critical to have a PC increment counter. If many of your instructions are ALU operations, you really need that ALU. Right. And you, you know that you definitely need your program counter increment every cycle. Right. That's why program counter has its own incrementer over here. Actually, that could be a nice question, nice exam question. Is that 30% of your instructions are ALU operations, and if you have one ALU where you also do the increment, what is your throughput of your pipeline, assuming everything else is ideal? You can think about it. <laughs> it's easy, actually. <laughs> okay, so data dependencies. Let's move on to more program-related dependencies. There are three types of data dependencies, and there's only one true one, which is the flow dependence. This is true data dependence. You have a read, to a register or a location after a write happens to that register. There is output dependence, I'll show you examples of this. This is write after write to the same register. And anti-dependence, which is write after read to the same register. You have a read register two, and then you have a write to register two. And you need to ensure correct semantics for all of these. But for all of, that, all of them, you need to ensure that the semantics of the program is correct. You cannot reorder these, right? In the program. Flow dependencies, well, you need to obey all of them, but flow dependencies, you especially need to obey them because they constitute true dependence on a value. Right. This is kind of not as fundamental if you think of anti and output dependencies. They're, they're really dependent on a name, and I'll foreshadow this because we're going to fix some of these with auto order execution later on. But a true dependence is you're writing to, let's say, register 2, and later you're reading from register 2, right? Let's say multiply and add. It doesn't matter what you have over here. Let's assume that it's not register 2. This add needs this result, definitely, right? It's a true dependence. This is a write, uh, read after write dependence. If you look at an output dependence, you have a multiply that's writing to R2, and later you have an add that's writing to R2. And you may have an add over here that's reading from R2. There's really no dependence here, right? Because this multiply is generating some results, and it happens to store its result into R2. Well, this add is generating results, and it ha happens to store its result into R2. And this multiply is generating a result, and it happens to store its result into R2 also. The compiler could have easily done this, perhaps, right? Assuming that all of the values would be correct. If the compiler had enough registers, it wouldn't run into this output dependence problem. Right. So why does that stall the pipeline? Well, uh, for this pipeline, actually, it doesn't stall it, <laughs> for the one I described it. But we'll see that it's, it may cause stalls later on. We'll see that quick, soon, actually. Does that make sense? So if two instructions are writing to the same register, there is a dependence on the name. You still need to guarantee that this add, the latest result, is really this add's result. Right? You cannot reorder these. But it's really a dependence on a name. If you had 10,000 registers, the compiler wouldn't have used R2. In fact, if you have an in infinite number of registers, you wouldn't ever have any output dependence or anti-dependence. Right? You would always store in a, a value that's produced to a new register. That's it. Think about data flow now. Data flow never actually has this kind of dependence. Right? The only dependence in data flow crossing, remember data flow from the first lecture? The only dependency, you always have values communicated between instructions. You never communicate these values between these instructions. OK, so keep this in mind. These are depends on a name, not a value. And we'll later see what we can do about them. Well, to, to foreshadow a little bit, in hardware, we'll try to imitate this, basically. In out-of-order execution, what, what we will do is we'll rename this register to a separate namespace 
to a separate register file that's not visible to the compiler, such that this dependence is eliminated, such that we can execute these instructions in any order we want. Here, you cannot execute these instructions in any order you want, because they're both writing to register 2. Whereas if you create another level of register file and rename register 2 to that register file and have separate registers allocated for these two different instructions, now you can execute them in any order you want. Make sense? OK. Yes? But even if you rename them, don't you still need the result of the add to execute the multiply? Uh, no,